Part 8. The Skill That Nobody Has. Twelve Tales. The Skill That Nobody Has. There was, in far-off times, a youth who lived near a small town in a mighty empire. He was bright and intelligent, and he impressed everyone with his ability to learn and his good neighborliness. He lived with his widowed mother. One day his mother said to him, Anwar, for this was his name, Anwar, you should really be thinking about settling down in life. True, you help the farmers like other lads. I know that you sit at home and make baskets like other people when there is nothing else to do. But you should either get married or set forth to seek your fortune in the wider world. At any rate, that is what I think about things. My dear mother, cried the boy, that is exactly what I want to do. I could stay at home and work permanently for one of the farmers, or I could go and try something really reckless, like travelling to very distant parts. But before attempting anything like that, I have made up my mind that I shall both stay fairly near to home and also become someone of importance. I shall marry the daughter of the emperor and live happily ever after. People like us, said the old lady, do not usually have such ideas. Why, hardly any of us ordinary working folk has ever seen the emperor, much less his daughter. And who are you, may I ask, to go to our monarch and ask such an outrageous thing? I, mother, am nobody to do so, said the youth. But you, now, that is another matter. I want you to go to the emperor and ask for the princess for a daughter-in-law. We can well imagine how the poor old thing felt. The boy Anwar was, it is true, the apple of her eye, but surely he was showing far too much recklessness and even rudeness in having such ambitions. Nonsense, she said, and set him to do so much work that for a time he forgot his plan. Then something reminded him again. He badgered his mother until she gave up, packed a bag with a few essentials, and made her way to the capital of the empire. Day after day the poor woman loitered near the palace, where she saw the glittering guard ride forth, the embassies from far-off lands arrive and depart, the towering walls behind which sat, in his throne room, the emperor himself. There was plenty of excitement in the streets, as there always is in a capital city. Processions and people of importance were everywhere, and both of them in their own proper place, were for the edification of the people. But how does one actually get into the presence of such a person as an emperor? She tried, and tried, and tried. Then she thought, If the emperor won't let me go to him, I must wait until he comes to me. So she stationed herself, day and night, outside the great mosque to which the emperor rode, on a white horse, to pray on Fridays. There was always a large crowd there, but after a time the old woman became known as the one who sat at a certain point. She chose this spot because it was just where the ruler turned his horse after mounting it. One Friday, then, she was sitting quietly in her usual position, when, as the emperor put his foot into the stirrup and glanced in her direction, she raised her hands in supplication. Have that woman brought to the palace, ordered the monarch, as soon as he saw her gesture. In a few minutes she was beside him in the throne room. You are a poor woman, as I can see, said his majesty and you had better speak if you seek a boon from me. But the woman was so awestruck by the place, and by being actually talking to the great man, that, although she opened her mouth, no sound came forth from it. So the emperor ordered that she be given a bag of gold and shown the door. These people can always do with money, he said to his courtiers. When the old lady returned home, her son said, 
Did you see the emperor? Indeed I did, Anwar. Did you appeal to him? I did. Did you enter his presence? Yes. And what did he say to my proposal of marriage to his daughter, the Princess Salma? Foolish boy, how could I, dressed in rags and without any of the manners of the court, say a thing like that? I said nothing, for I was overcome with the splendour of the place. But his imperial majesty was more than kind, and has given us this bag, heavy with gold. You can use it to set yourself up in trade. That will give you a career and a lifetime's fulfilment. Forget all this nonsense about princesses. Mother, I don't want gold. I want the princess, said Anwar. He continued to pester her until she was forced to set off once again to the capital. There the emperor saw her again, sitting in her corner. He called her to him and again asked her what she wanted. Again she was too frightened to speak. Again he gave her a bag of gold and sent her away. And the same thing happened when she returned to her humble cottage, with Anwar not at all reconciled after all the emperor's kindness. Finally, Anwar said to his mother, I have decided not to stay at home. I have decided not to accept the comfortable life which the gold would give me. I have decided to seek the emperor's daughter, and I shall therefore set off tomorrow morning to find out how I can win her. The next day, as dawn broke, he left the house and started to walk along the road, through the woods. As the road turned at the top of a hill, Anwar came across a wise man, sitting by the way, with a pointed cap on his head, his robe made up of small squares of rag carefully stitched together. Peace upon you, your presence the dervish, said Anwar politely. And what do you seek, little brother? asked the dervish. I am seeking the way in which I can approach the emperor and ask for the hand of his daughter in marriage, for I have set my heart upon it, said Anwar. That is difficult, said the wise man, unless you are first prepared to learn the skill that nobody has. How can there be such a thing if it is called the skill that nobody has? asked the youth. Nobody has it because people do it, said the dervish, and they can only do it when they have something, some other things. When they have the things, the skill works for them, so they don't really have to have it. This is extremely difficult, said Anwar, but can you tell me how to go about it? Yes, indeed, said the old man. You keep straight on, allowing nothing to deflect you, sticking with the same road, and not thinking that anything is more important than the road. Anwar thanked the dervish and went on his way. The road led him on and on, and he lived as best he could on wild fruits, roots and berries, and the kindness of various people whom he met. From time to time people suggested that he should take up employment with them, or interest himself in their crafts and occupations, or even marry their daughters. But Anwar kept on, although after a very long time he began to feel more and more that the road was leading nowhere at all. And then, one day, as it was coming to nightfall, Anwar saw that the road did indeed end. That is to say, instead of passing a certain towering fortress, it led straight within the walls through a wide gate. Anwar followed it in. The gatekeeper challenged him. What do you seek? I am in search of the princess, whom I am determined to marry, answered Anwar. You cannot pass, unless you have a more reasonable object than that, shouted the guardian of the gate, and he levelled a sharpened spike at poor Anwar. Anwar said, Well then, I am going to learn the skill that nobody has. That's different, said the guard, lowering his weapon. But, he added sulkily, 
Someone must have told you about it, because people usually imagine that they can approach the princess direct. Anwar went on his way and found himself inside the grounds of an enormous castle. In a small pavilion in the grounds was a silent figure sitting in contemplation. As Anwar approached him, he saw that it was the very same dervish whom he had met on the road those many moons ago. As you have arrived here at last without taking any notice of the temptations of the road, said the dervish, you may undergo the next test. He showed Anwar into a long, low meditation hall, where rows of silent dervishes were reposing, their heads on their knees. Anwar sat down. Then the dervishes started to perform exercises, and Anwar found himself compelled to emulate them. When this was over, he was assigned to the master gardener and made to work digging and hoeing, watering and pruning, tending plants and cutting paths, until his hands were as sore as his back ached. And all this continued for many months. Next, he was taken to the room of the master of the monastery and had to go there every day for hours on end while the great man looked at him, saying nothing. This continued for many more months. After that, Anwar was assigned to the kitchens, where he worked like a slave, preparing food for the hundreds of dervishes who lived in the precincts and for the people who constantly visited the monastery as well as for the many festivals which were conducted by the brethren. At times Anwar felt that he was being useful, at other times that he was wasting his own time, for he thought constantly about the princess, and also about the skill that nobody has. But worse still lay before him. That was when he had no work at all to do. He was not invited to take part in the dervish's exercises. He had no place in the kitchens, and he was not wanted in the gardens. Many other young men came and went. Most of them seemed happy enough, but in conversations with them he could not learn much about the community and what the meaning was of its activities, indeed whether there was any meaning at all. Then, one day, after some years, Anwar was called into the presence of the master of the monastery. As he reached the Hujra, the room where the master interviewed people, he saw that the old man was about to fall into a well which suddenly opened up in the middle of the floor. Anwar just managed to save him. My son, said the sage, handing him a key, take this key and look after it with your life. Anwar went on working at the monastery until he was called into the presence of the chief of the gardeners, and he saw that a tree was toppling and was about to fall on that sage's head. Anwar just managed to prevent that happening and save the man's life. My son, said the head gardener, take this crystal pebble and guard it with your life. He went back to work and was called, after a very long time, to the presence of the chief of the kitchens. When he got there, he saw that the man was about to lift a burning hot ladle from a pot on the fire. Anwar snatched it first and was burned on the thumb. My son, said the chief of the kitchens, you will now have a callus at the base of that thumb. Guard it with your life. After many more months in the monastery, Anwar was called into the assembly hall, where all the dervishes were sitting having dinner. At the head of the table sat a haughty prince, with a very superior mien and dressed in glorious robes. As everyone listened, the prince told a long and complicated story. As if it were within him, Anwar heard the prince's voice say, Remember this story and guard it with your life. Many days after this, Anwar was told to go to the place in the garden where he had first seen the dervish. 
When he got there, the old man was sitting as before in contemplation. Raising his head, he said, Anwar, you are now ready to continue with your quest. You will succeed, for I have given you the skill that nobody has. But I do not understand it, said Anwar. If you think that you do, said the sage, you do not. If, on the other hand, you think that you do not, you can exercise it without interference. I still do not understand, said Anwar. If you had left us, you would never have learnt, said the dervish. And if I drive you out, you will learn. If you try to come back, you will not learn. If you need help, I will appear. Why is that? asked Anwar in some confusion. Because apart from certain things which you have, I am a part of the skill which cannot stay with you, so it has to be kept in me. So Anwar set off towards the gate of the fortress, and as he came up to the guardian of the entrance and looked at his face, he saw that he was the same man as the dervish who had been talking to him. Just outside stood the chief of the gardens, the head of the kitchen, and the chief of the monastery, and all other people whom he had met since he entered the place. Each and every one of them had the face of the dervish whom he had first met on the roadside near the top of the hill after he had left his mother's cottage. I shall never be able to understand this, Anwar said to himself, but he continued on his way. When he looked back, he saw that the monastery was no longer there, and even the road before him had changed. Instead of leading back towards his own home, it ran in a completely different direction. Anwar continued along it nonetheless. After many days he came upon a huge and brilliantly lit city, and asked what it was. This, said a passerby, is the capital of the empire, no less. Anwar asked him how many years had passed since the year in which he had set out and the man looked at him oddly. Why, only a single year, he said. By Anwar's own reckoning, he had spent more than thirty years in that monastery, so he realized that in some strange way time was not the same everywhere. In the center of the city, Anwar came across a deep well, and heard cries coming from it. A rope ran down into the well, and he started to haul it up. A crowd gathered as he was straining with his utmost strength, and he almost let the rope go, but he was able to sustain the terrible chafing through the callus on his thumb. Finally, a man emerged from the well. He thanked Anwar and said, You must be the man from afar, about whom it is prophesied that he alone will be able to save me. I am the chief minister of his imperial majesty, imprisoned in the well by a genie, and I will see that you are rewarded. So saying, he went his way. Anwar was still rather surprised by this when a strange and fearsome figure jumped upon him. Aha! it said, son of man, you are my prey, and I shall eat you alive as I do everyone in this city whom I desire to devour. We genies are in control of the streets of the capital, and nobody can resist us except people who have earned the crystal pebble of Suleiman, son of David, which binds all the genies on earth. Hearing this, Anwar snatched the pebble crystal from his pocket and held it before the genie, who immediately dissolved into flashes of fire and scuttled away far into the distance. No sooner had he done this than a man on horseback came galloping up to him and said, I am the Emperor's herald. It has been foretold that anyone who can rescue the minister may be able to overcome the genies. Such a man may well have earned the key to the enchanted room in which the princess is imprisoned. The man who can open that door is to be her husband, and to rule the realm when his imperial majesty is no more. Anwar mounted behind him 
and they sped to the palace. The man took him to a room where Anwar fitted the key to the lock. The door swung open, and there he saw the most beautiful lady whom human eyes had ever beheld. It was, of course, the princess, and she came forward and the pair fell in love the instant their eyes met. And so it was that Anwar, the poor boy from the cottage in a remote province, became the husband of the Princess Salma, and emperor too in the fullness of time. And he and his consort are reigning there yet. The story which the haughty prince at the monastery table told them, they found, contained all the elements for a just, peaceful and successful rule. And whenever they, their country or their children were faced with any difficulties, they found that they had the skill that nobody has, for they were able to use their experience, the magical objects given to them, and the advice of the mysterious dervish, who always appeared and advised them when they needed him. The Man Who Went in Search of His Fate There was once a man, and there have been many like him both before and since, who decided that he should make a change in his life. What is the point, he asked himself, of trying to do things, or letting things happen to me, if I do not know my fate? If he worked against his fate, he reasoned he would suffer and in the end the fate would be the same. If, on the other hand, he did nothing, his destiny would be a minor and uninteresting one, like that of the thousands of ordinary people all over the world, who had uneventful lives. He had to start somewhere, so he sold his few possessions and began to walk along the highway which passed through his hometown. He had not been walking for very long when he came to a tea house, where he saw a dervish sitting, talking to a number of people. The traveller, whose name was Akram, waited until the audience had gone, and then approached the man of wisdom. Reverend man of the path, he said, I am in search of my fate, and wonder whether you can suggest how I might start on this important endeavour. This is easier believed possible than it is achieved, replied the dervish and it would be better to ask how to recognize your fate than to assume you can do so without preparation. But I am sure that I can recognize my fate, cried Akram, because it is well known that one's fate is a reflection of oneself, and surely I can tell if I meet someone who looks like me. Looking like you externally is not the same thing as being a reflection of you, said the dervish especially when, like everyone else, you have so many sides that you find it hard to see your own reflection in all its forms. The mirror of perception is as fleeting and as miscellaneous as the wavelets of the sea, each briefly shining forth with the borrowed light of the sun as it breaks upon the seashore. The dervish continued in this vein for some time, and Akram, who had met dervishes before, stopped listening to him. He came to the conclusion that there would be nothing that he could profit from here. Still, he thought, it would be nice to have company on the journey. When the dervish had stopped talking, Akram said, Mystical analogies are, of course, too deep for me to understand. But if you are travelling, might I accompany you, at least for part of the way? for I am unversed in the experiences and practices of journeying. The dervish agreed, and they set off along the road. Presently they saw a tree by the roadside, and from it was clearly to be heard a strong buzzing sound. The dervish said, Put your ear to the trunk of the tree, and see what you can hear. Akram followed his advice and realized that the tree was hollow. Inside there was a very large number of bees. The dervish said, The bees are trapped. If you can manage to break off that branch, they will be released and will be able to escape. 
It might be a kindly act, and who knows where it might lead. Akram answered, Old man, you are not of this world. Has it not been said that one should not be distracted from one's objective by minor matters? Now supposing that someone were to offer me some money for breaking the branch, I would accept, for I have no money for my journey. But to do it for nothing is absurd. As you will, said the dervish, and they continued on their way. When it was dark, they lay down to sleep. In the morning, they were woken by a man going past with two large jars strapped to the sides of his donkey. He stopped to pass the time of day. Where are you going? asked the dervish. To market to sell this honey. It should fetch at least three pieces of gold. Yesterday I heard some bees in a hollow tree, and they seemed to want to get out. So I broke a dead branch and they swarmed. I found this huge amount of honey, and, from being a pauper, I am on the way to supporting myself. And he went on his way. Akram said to the dervish, I should perhaps have got to the honey first, as you suggested. But, on the other hand, it may not have been the same tree, and in that case I would probably have been stung, and that is not the fate I am looking for. The dervish said nothing. Further along the road they came to a bridge over a river and stopped to admire the view. Suddenly a fish poked its head out of the water and looked at them, its mouth opening and shutting in a quite pathetic way. What do you think that means? Akram asked. The dervish said, Cup your hands with interlaced fingers and see whether you can understand the speech of the fish. When Akram did as the dervish suggested, he found that he could indeed understand the fish, who was saying, Help me! Help me! The dervish called out, What help do you seek? The fish answered, I have swallowed a sharp stone. There is a certain herb growing in profusion on the river bank. If you would kindly pluck some and throw it to me, I could bring up the stone and find some relief. A talking fish indeed, said Akram. I think that this is some sort of a trick of magic or ventriloquism. I refuse to make myself ridiculous. In any case, I am in search of my fate. Dervish, if this strange happening is anything to do with you, perhaps you might care to help yonder fish yourself. The dervish only said, No, I shall not do anything. Let us be on our way. Soon afterwards, they entered a town and sat down in the marketplace to rest. Presently a man came galloping into the square on a fine horse, obviously very excited. Dismounting, he shouted to the townspeople, A miracle! A miracle! As everyone gathered around the horseman, he said, I was crossing a bridge when, believe it or not, a fish spoke to me, and it asked me to throw it some herbs. I did so, and after eating them it threw up a flawless diamond as big as both my fists. Akram called out, How do you know that it is a real diamond? I am a jeweller, said the man. How typical of life, said Akram, that a man of wealth should get even more, while I, unable to succour the fish because I was on important business, am forced to beg my bread in the company of a most uninteresting dervish. The dervish said, Oh well, perhaps it was not the same fish. Perhaps, indeed, that man is lying. Let us look forward and not back. That is all rather like a philosopher, said Akram, but much the same thoughts were in my own mind. They continued on their way. The next event in their journey was when they stopped to eat beside a rock embedded in the ground. A low humming seemed to be coming from the rock, and Akram put his ear to it. He found that the sound came from under the rock, and as he listened he could understand what it meant. It was a number of ants, and they were saying, If we could only move this rock or get through it somehow, we would be able to extend our kingdom and find room for all our people. 
If only something could come to our aid. This hard material down here is too difficult to get through. If only someone or something would take it away. Akram looked at the dervish and said, The ants want the rock moved so that they can extend their kingdom. What have I to do with ants, rocks, or kingdoms? First I must find my fate. The dervish said nothing, and they continued on their way. The following day, when they were rising from their miserable bivouac under a hedge, they heard the sound of many people coming their way, singing and shouting with glee. Presently they saw that a large band of rustics was on the road, dancing and playing fiddles and pipes, leaping and somersaulting with delight. As they passed, Akram asked one of them what had happened. The man said, A goat herd, believe it or not, heard some ants murmuring under a rock in great distress. He moved it so that they could extend their nest. What do you think he found underneath? Why, a huge treasure of gold pieces. He took it and shared it with all his neighbours, and we are the lucky villagers who benefited. They went on their way, still delirious with delight. The dervish said to Akram, You are a fool, for you have thrice failed to do even the simplest thing that might have brought you the fortune which you desired. You are a fool, because you are even less prepared to follow your fate than all those people who just did a kind action and were not obsessed by their fate and their personal desires. You are a fool. For you have, instead of following your fate, distanced yourself from it by your behaviour and your failure to look at what is beneath your nose. Above all, you are a fool because you did not attend to what I am and what I have said, not said and indicated. Akram, like many another before and since, became enraged. He shouted at the dervish, Self-satisfied and domineering know-all. Anyone can be wise after the event. I noticed that you, a miserable and underfed wanderer on the face of the earth, did not take any advantage of the great things which you are now such an expert upon. Perhaps you can tell me why that is. I can indeed, replied the dervish. I could not benefit myself because I had other things to do. You see... I am your fate. Then the dervish disappeared, and he has never been seen again, except, of course, by all the Akrams who have lived since that time many, many years ago. The Greed for Obstinacy There was once an honest man who had never, in his life, taken advantage of others. He was kind and hard-working, but he had not achieved any success in life. This man, whose name was Single Mind, was constantly being betrayed and exploited, but this did not trouble him particularly, because, quite rightly, he knew that his own straightforwardness could not be corrupted by the villainy of others. Single mind practiced charity and generosity and kindness to the full extent of his capacity, reposing his trust in the justice which would follow such a life, as he was convinced it must. But he was not tranquil in mind, so he went to a Sufi and asked him what to do. The Sufi said, Brother, honesty, hard work, kindness, these are all things which are of the utmost importance to humankind, if realization is to be attained. But you must make sure that you are really honest, that you are, indeed, not offsetting your generosity by an equally harmful greed for obstinacy in following your own opinions about your way of action. The Sufi offered him a way of observing and correcting himself but Single Mind did not like to hear his honesty described as obstinacy and concluded that the Sufi must be wrong. 
He resolved, therefore, to make a journey to see the great Saint Musa al-Kazim, to seek his advice as to how his fortune and the prospects of spiritual development might be changed. He set off along the road. Presently this good man, crossing a wilderness, came upon a very fierce-looking tiger which was rolling in the dust. When he saw the traveller, the tiger stopped doing this and said, Son of man, where are you going? Single Mind said, Unfortunate in my past and present, uncertain as to my future, I am seeking the great Saint Musa al-Kazim to beseech him to give me his advice. I am sure the tiger, said the wild beast, and I beg of you to ask the saint what I can do to improve my own condition, for I am miserable and out of sorts. There is something wrong with me and I need perceptive advice. Willingly, said Single Mind, and continued on his way. In the course of time he arrived at the bank of a river and saw a great fish with its mouth opening and shutting, half in and half out of the water. The fish said, Son of man, where are you going? Single Mind told all that had happened. I am Mahi the fish, said the fish, and there is something wrong with me. For some reason I cannot swim in the water, and I need some kind of help. Please ask the saint when you see him to send me advice on my problem. Single Mind promised to do so, and continued on his way. After much journeying the pilgrim came upon three men. They were wearily digging in a piece of sandy ground. Single Mind stopped and asked them why they were labouring so hard in such an unpromising field. We are the three sons of a good man who has recently died, they told him. Our father left us this land and told us to dig it, which is what we are doing, but it seems to us that it is so poor that nothing will ever grow on it. They asked Single Mind what his mission was, and when he told them, they begged him to ask for the saint's solution to their own difficulty. Single Mind willingly promised to help them in this way, and continued on his journey. Eventually the traveller reached his destination, and found the great teacher sitting, as always, modestly and without ostentation, with a group of people who had come to learn from him. When Single Mind approached, the saint said, Speak, and Single Mind said, I am such and such a man, and I have come to seek your help, but before I do so I have certain representations to make, Lord, on behalf of three men, a fish and a tiger whom I met on my long journey, and who may be deserving of your kindness. When asked to continue, he recited the difficulties which beset the men, the fish, and the animal. Your presence might now kindly deign to allow this unworthy person to describe his own condition, so that advice for him, too, might generously be forthcoming. But Musa al-Kazim said, My brother, your answer has already been contained in what I have advised. So Single Mind retraced his steps, wondering how he could understand, from what the saint had said, how to solve his own problems. In due time he came upon the three men, still working in the barren field. He told them, I have consulted the great saint, and this is his advice. Let the three men, he said, dig in the exact middle of the field. They will find an underground chamber with treasures which are theirs. This is the meaning of the instruction of their father to dig the field. Single Mind helped the three men to follow this advice and presently they came upon a treasure of incalculable size, together with a number of remarkable instruments which would enable people to achieve what most men call wonders, whether in the service of humanity or otherwise. The brothers offered Single Mind his pick of gold or of the wondrous devices, but he said, Kind friends, I have only done my duty. All this belongs to you and I have no right to covet it. May you be in peace. And he went on his way.
Eventually, too, he came upon the great fish, who asked him if he had been able to obtain any guidance for the relief of her suffering. Lady Fish, said Single Mind, the great saint has, by his wonderful perceptions, alleviated the lot of three pauper brothers, indicating a treasure to them. His advice about your case was as follows. Let a blow be struck on the left side of the head of the fish, and she will thenceforward be able to swim and gambol in the water quite normally. The fish begged Single Mind to help, so he took his staff and struck her a blow on the place which the saint had indicated. No sooner had he done so than the fish slid into the water and swam, leaping and playing with unrestrained joy. Then she glided through the water to Single Mind and thanked him deeply for his help. But Single Mind said, Mahi, when I struck your head, it split a lump which seems to have been upsetting your balance. Yes, yes, said Mahi, but that is nothing to me. I only know that I am free and well. Single Mind continued, Out of that place on your head has dropped, and is here on the bank, a diamond larger than a watermelon. Take it, or someone will surely steal it. And what is that to me, a fish? said Mahi, and she streaked away, calling down blessings upon her benefactor. Oh, my sister, Single Mind called out after her, you will be robbed if I leave the jewel lying here. And he threw the huge gem into the water near where he had seen the fish disappear. Ultimately, going his way, the traveller came to the place where the troubled tiger sat. He recited all his adventures, and the tiger asked what Musa al Kazim had advised in his own case. The saint, said Single Mind, specifically stated that your condition could be alleviated only by devouring a fool. Do that, and you will have no further troubles. And neither will you, roared the tiger, leaping upon him. Milk of the Lioness there was once a time, which was not a time, when, in a far-off kingdom, all the people were waiting for the king's three daughters to be married. According to the laws of that realm, princesses of the blood royal had the right to make absolutely anyone they wished their mates, and on this occasion the ladies found it difficult to make up their minds. Finally they asked their father to have the entire population of the kingdom paraded past them, so that they could make a choice. The first princess decided upon the tall and handsome son of one of the ministers, and the second chose the muscular and dashing son of the emir al Jaish, commander of the armies, as indeed everyone had always thought they would. But the third and youngest princess could not decide, and the endless stream of people only confused her more. So the princess took an apple and threw it into the air, saying, Whoever catches this shall be my husband. Now it so happened that in the crowd in the public square where this was taking place, there stood a young man with a limp and a hunched back, with his turban end thrown across his face, wearing ragged clothes and walking with the aid of a staff. This was the man who caught the apple and who dragged himself to the platform where the royal family sat to claim his prize. The crowd cheered, more because of habit than anything else, for inwardly they did not feel happy that such a man should become one of the ruling house. The son of the minister and the military commander's son muttered to themselves and to each other, and the king said to his minister, The royal word may never be withdrawn, so let the stupid girl have the clown or buffoon or whatever he is. At least I have two stalwart and reliable sons-in-law. What nobody knew at that time, of course, was that the youth was only pretending to be what he seemed to be. The lameness was affected and the crouched posture was assumed, and he covered the lower part of his face because he did not want to be recognised. 
He was a fugitive Hashemite emir, concealing himself from persecution. All three girls were married, and since the young prince Ibn Haydar did not reveal himself, he and his bride were banished to a stable to live by her enraged father. Even his own wife did not realize who Ibn Haydar was, but she loved him, whatever he looked like, and both of them accepted the life of poverty and ostracism which was their lot. Ibn Haydar used to walk, in the evenings, out of the city and contemplate in a small cave where nobody else ever seemed to go. After some months he met an old man who said to him, Son of the lion, which is what Ibn Haydar means, you must wait until the day of lion milk. When you hear of this, you should take action towards the restitution. And the old man handed him a clear stone. Rub this stone in your right hand and think of a very small broken coin and you can summon the magical charcoal mare. So saying, he went on his way. Now it came to pass that the king was engaged in war, and he rode out with his armies, his two valiant sons-in-law, and his commanders to engage the enemy. Naturally, they left the lame and misshapen Ibn Haydar behind. They fought many battles, but at last it seemed that the invaders of the country were gaining the upper hand. At this point, Ibn Haydar felt the stone grow hot in his pocket, and he took it out, remembering the broken coin. As he turned it in his fingers, a splendid charcoal-coloured mare appeared. It said to him, My lord, put on the accoutrements in my saddlebags. We ride to war. When he was fully arrayed in knightly mail, the youth leapt upon the back of the horse, and she flew through the skies until they reached the battlefield. The mysterious knight fought from dawn to dusk until the enemy were routed, almost entirely through his bravery. The king rode up to him and threw his own cashmere shawl around his neck, saying, Blessings upon you, lordly one, for you have aided the good and opposed evil, and we are eternally in your debt. But Ibn Haydar said nothing. He bowed to the king, raised his lance in salutation, and spurring the magical mare into the clouds, returned home. When the warriors arrived back at the capital, they were full of tales of the mysterious knight who had saved them, and spoke of him as the Black Knight of Heaven. The king said again and again, Would that I had a son-in-law like that! Ibn Haydar, of course, continued to be the butt of jokes, a curiosity and a non-entity, even though he was the husband of a princess. After some months, the young man was sitting in his stable when he felt the stone grow hot again. When he took it out and rubbed it, not forgetting to think of the coin, the horse appeared and said, On my back, we have work to do. The horse took him to the king's castle, through a window into the royal bedchamber, where Ibn Haydar was just in time to snatch and kill a snake which was about to strike at the head of the king. At that moment the monarch awoke and saw what had happened. In the gloom he could not see who his deliverer was, but he took off his priceless ruby ring and handed it to him, saying, I owe you my life, whoever you are. This ring shall be a token for you. Ibn Haydar took the ring, and his steed flew him back to the miserable stable. His life continued as before for a number of months, when the stone called him again, and he summoned the horse. Put on the robe and turban in my saddlebags, cried the mare, for we have work to do. The animal carried Ibn Haydar to the king's throne room, where a man had just been condemned to death. The executioner had already spread his leather carpet to catch the blood, and was awaiting the royal signal with sword upraised. At the sight of the black mare with the robed figure upon it, everyone stiffened as if made of wood. Ibn Haydar waited, and within a few moments there was a commotion at the throne room door. A man had arrived with proof that the condemned man was innocent. Everyone at the court was amazed, 
and the king said to the mysterious apparition, Blessings upon him who intervenes for justice. Take this sword of mine as a token. Without a word, Ibn Haydar girded on the sword, and the mare took him back through the clouds to his stable. Nothing of great importance happened for many more months, until one day the king became ill. It was as if the whole world had darkened, and people went about the streets as if in mourning. Even the animals were silent, the trees drooped, and the sun itself seemed dim. No doctor could find out what ailed the ruler, until the greatest of them all, the Hakim al hukuma the doctor of all doctors, pronounced, This illness is to be cured only by a draught of the milk of a lioness, brought from the land of not-being. Immediately the two sons-in-law of the king offered themselves for the task, and rode out from the palace in full determination to earn the glory of saving their lord and master. After many days they arrived at a crossroads, where a wise man sat. The road branched into three highways, and the two men were unable to decide which one to follow. They explained their mission to the wise man, who said, These three roads have names. The first is called The Road of Those Who Do As We Do, The Bond of Blood. The second is called The Road of Those Who Think As We Do, The Bond of Decision and the third is called the Road of Truth. The first son-in-law said, I shall take the Road of Blood, for it is through kinship with His Majesty that I am here. He spurred his horse on its way. The second son-in-law cried, I shall take the Road of Decision, for decisiveness is my way, and he galloped away. Presently the first young man came to a man at the entrance to a city and asked him where he was. You are at the gateway to the land of not being, answered the man, but you cannot enter it until you have played chess with me. They sat and played, and the young man lost. He lost his horse, his armour, his money, and finally his freedom. The other man took him into the city and sold him to a cooked meat seller, and there he stayed for many days. As to the second youth, he, too, arrived at the gateway of the city, and the same thing happened to him. He was taken into the city and sold as a slave to a sweetmeat seller. After several months, when there was no sign of the return of the champions, Ibn Haydar felt the stone grow hot in his pocket, and he summoned the black mare. The time is now, she said. Jump on my back. He followed the same road until he reached the spot where the wise man sat and told him his mission. The man gave him his choice of the three roads, and Ibn Haydar said at once, I choose the road of truth. He was about to continue on his way when the wise man said, You have made the right choice. Continue, but when you get to the chess player, Challenge him to combat rather than playing with him. Ibn Haydar went on, and when the chess player asked him to play, he drew his sword and cried, For truth, not tricks. Face reality, not token battle. See before you him who says, O people of Hashim. For that was his battle cry. The chess player surrendered without a fight and told Ibn Haydar what had happened to his brothers-in-law. He took him into the city and showed him where the lionesses were kept. After outwitting the guards and taming the beasts, the young man took three flasks of milk. He put one in each saddlebag and one in his turban as a precaution against their being broken or lost. Now he went to the sweetmeat seller and the vendor of cooked meats and brought back the other two young men, although they did not recognize him in his knightly garb. That night, however, the pair of them, who knew that he had the lioness's milk, stole a flask each and fled the city under cover of darkness. Ibn Haydar gave them time to reach the palace and then mounted the magical mare which, faster than an arrow, carried him to the very sick room of the ailing king. As he alighted from his horse and strode to the bed, 
the assembled doctors and courtiers and the brothers-in-law were awe-stricken at his appearance. As the turban he wore the cashmere shawl of the king, on his finger was the great ruby ring, and at his side hung the royal sword. Here is the milk of the lionesses of the land of not being, he said as he approached the bed. But you are too late, everyone cried. The king said, These sons-in-laws of mine have brought back the milk, but it does me no good. Ibn Haydar said, That is because they stole it from me, who obtained it, and all special virtue flees from something obtained by theft. Here is the third flask. Take a draught, O king. As soon as the king had swallowed a little of the milk, he sat up, completely cured. The king said, Whence do you come, and who are you, and why do you help me? The young man said, The three questions are one question, and an answer to the first is an answer to all. The answer to the second is an answer to all. The answer to the third is an answer to all. The king did not understand. Very well, said Ibn Haydar. I am the man who lives in the stable, which means I am your son-in-law, which is why I help you. And that was how Ibn Haydar came to inherit the crown of the kingdom when the king was taken, in the fullness of time, on his longest journey.